A couple of weeks ago, I was saying here how in some future where the world is enjoying a very dull peace, we will very much miss the passion and the challenge when fighting for the causes we hold close to our hearts. When I say we, I, I mean some of you. I, I'm usually done caring after breakfast. Yes, with nothing to gather for, to march the streets in outrage, when it's a struggle to point to an injustice anywhere, we will surely miss the days when we got riled up over injustices, wars, thoughtless prejudice and aggression misdirected. But what is a protester? Are they the vanguard for a new society, the mechanism of reform, or just a bunch of useful idiots, as our comrades in the former glorious USSR once called them? Are you protesting when recycling? No. How about deciding not to spend your money on bad business? That kind of non-action worked well against the ivory trade, didn't it? Almost no one buys anything made from elephant teeth anymore. Well, except in China. So that's not protesting. It is just market manipulation for a good cause. And I, for one, won't spend a dime on certain low-level goods, no matter how many Joe and Tony text messages I get Friday afternoons. My petty refusal hasn't altered that market. Are state-sponsored sanctions a protest? Sanctions against Russia fail, and generally makes things worse. A meretricious bleat with skirts raised. No genuine protest. I ask because here, just uh, over the 30 seconds mark of a video when the kids have gone to bed, as they do when not jumping across to TikTok, where do we look for the noble protester? To me, like ice creams, the agitator comes in two forms, in a cone or on a stick. The ones with a stick holding them up their middle are the social network protesters. For them, the march is a party, a chance to clap each other on the back, get some fresh air, block traffic, goad police, sniff some tear gas and run, jeer at big oil, large farmer, or poke that same smelly stick at the secret powers, deep state, Bill Gates and Shoros, the Jews, of course, or any of the usual suspects. I, I just can't bring myself to hand out merit badges to group agitators. It seems too easy and protected. What about the protesters who have no stick, who have, who have to go it alone, the dissident in a cone, the objector who is trapped in some narrowing tunnel and outnumbered? Prison, you will not be surprised, is where I found examples of those much rarer rejectionists. Protesters willing to suffer for their cause. And in prison there are two main streams of protest. The most hallowed, the most noble, as it is seen, is protest by hunger strike. How long does that go back? Quite a way. Think of Emily Davison, the suffragette, being force-fed during her strike. There's an idea around that the suffragettes of the early 1900s were trailblazers for women's rights. They were not. As historian Simon Webb recently noted, they were only interested in voting rights for women of their class, their own group, landowners, or those with university degrees. They had no interest in the workers. They paid chemists to make bombs for them, which they'd explode in public places. They sent letter bombs. If they'd been men, they would be remembered today as terrorists. Instead, they have a rail line named after them, London's suffragette line. Now, that's actually an insult. It's like saying, oh, they were just dotty upper-class women, harmless, really, not to be taken seriously. 
It's bad when today's do-gooders can't see an insult when it's hurled. Before I go on, I've got to ask the obvious. Since when did prisons become so civilised that they tolerated protest in any form? Remember that at one point in the past, if a prisoner banged his tin cup on the door or flung his food at an officer, then it was straight to the rack or the gibbet. I never raked my prison cup over the cell bars. I usually had fine porcelain, which, of course, would chip. So, for prison protest to be a thing shows a certain civility. The days of prisoner causing trouble equals dead prisoner have long gone. Let's keep that in mind. Indeed, the hunger strike was seen as honourable. The Mahatma, the great soul, Gandhi, was imprisoned five times between 1922 and 1942, passing on the dinner plate every time. While in a Pakistan jail, I saw that prisoners on hunger strikes were given some incentive to end their protest. Each day, they would be dragged from the cell and flogged. A wide and thick leather belt, since you asked, the chitta, uh, that took a double-handed grip to keep control of it. When I heard a hunger strike was going on there, I just couldn't see the image uh, of a PK prison officer holding a chapati in one hand and pleading with a cup of steaming chai in the other. I knew there'd be a catch. Bobby Sands, a soldier in the Irish Republican Army, refused food for 66 days while a prisoner at the Maze in Northern Ireland in, what was it, 1981. His protest was, I think, about the prison authorities' refusal to give him and others of the IRA the status of political prisoners. He'd been imprisoned for planning a bombing of some kind, Oh, and uh, a gun battle that followed. Bobby was 27 when he died. Nine other hunger strikers died with him at staged intervals for maximum effect. I must say they died rather quickly, some in less than two months. Inactivity perhaps a factor, uh, death wish. But was this a protest? Yeah, sure. What else? But what did they want? Trivial things they could get anyway, like visits, letters, parcels not working, or wearing prison uniforms. Were they real demands? If not striking, he could have all those things and more. Bobby Sands was even elected to British Parliament while in prison. He didn't survive to take his seat. The strikers deaths gave a massive boost to their cause. Millions of dollars raised in the USA from well, sentimental Irish Americans, while Sinn Féin, the Republican left party, was boosted to near respectability. Just two years ago, Sinn Féin gained the largest number of votes in the Northern Ireland Assembly. Uh, by the way, I put the pictures of real prisoners of war to make a point that words should not express. So, not good for the dead strikers, good for everyone else. The convicted paramilitaries later refused to leave their cells for showers or wear anything other than blankets, certainly not the uniforms. They smeared shit on the cell walls in quite colourful ways, they ate, of course, uh, something that must have been a fine balance, so they'd have lots of art materials. Outside, the dirty protests inspired many artworks using more conventional paints, including The Citizen by Richard Hamilton that can be seen at London's Tate Gallery. Over many years in prisons, both East and West, I've witnessed Many annoy the staff protests. In an Australian supermax, Kevin the psychopath would apologise to me and warn me that for the next five hours on the block, it would be noisy. I'm going to have to work on the railroads, Dave, he'd say, offering me 
old airline earplugs. They've refused to give me my contact tin. Kev used contact adhesive when making big, ugly and heavy soft toys for a charity. Well, a tin of the inflammable glue had that week been poured over an inmate who was then set on fire. The inmate died horribly, of course. Kevin took to his protest like a professional. He'd lay a blanket on his cell floor by the sliding steel door. Uh, have himself locked in, he'd lie on his back and begin a methodical thundering on the metal door with his feet while singing. I think he had special shoes, I'm sure he did. When not singing, he'd sip a cup of tea or read a book held in one hand. The guards couldn't take much of that for long, as it echoed along the corridors to their posts. After three days, Kev got his glue, on the understanding that he would not incinerate anyone. Well, not without a good cause. I noticed that dirty strikes in Australian prisons were shorter, but more intense. I guess the prison officers didn't care if they lived in their own poop. A friend from the 1980s, Peter Allen, turned up the dirty protest dial while held in Pentridge Prison's H Division in Melbourne. Peter, I should say, was the smartest of the Allen Pettingill clan, while his brother Dennis Allen was a notorious killer or portrayed well in the Animal Kingdom series. So it was with a little style that Peter confronted his guards after smashing up his cell, smearing the walls with bowel movements, and armed with turd grenades as they flung open the door. He was covered head to foot in brown, his hair matted in fecal clumps. At the time, such protests were called bronzing up. I think that was a tanning reference. Peter recalled, I had a chocolate log in one hand and a big fat mouse bar in the other, a full bronze up. The stink was awful. I had to roll up little plugs from toilet paper and shove them up my nose to stop me from gagging. The cell was in near darkness, the thick glass window now a peculiar stained glass. Say, um, does anyone remember TV's Bonanza, the old-style western, with a family living at the Ponderosa Ranch? Ben Cartwright, Big Hoss Dan Blocker. A 1960s classic, the Ponderosa. Back uh, to Peter in Melbourne. The cell door smashed against the brickwork. The heavy-suited guards winced at the stench. They angled their shields forward. Peter took aim. Good thing the turds were just sloppy enough to drop. He'd flung them above their heads onto the cell doorway keystone. They looked up, too late to pull in their shields to stop the dripping munitions. As they fell, we all hoped the guards might have seen the inscription Peter had hand-painted on the far wall ceiling <laughs> in a rich walnut. Welcome to the Bronzerosa, it read. He had written it with his rectal crayons. The Bronzerosa, the poo ranch from hell. Backing out with speckle and dash in their visors, officers in retreat, it was a brief victory for Peter, whose baton flaying would soon follow after the fire hose. From a bad batch, Peter had some class in the kind of lonely and futile protest that takes more dedication than I can imagine.